series. Um, so Stephen came to us from Canada, uh, where he had done uh, uh, civil marine uh, degrees. He did a, a PhD in marine biology, diploma in geographic information systems, and a master's at, uh, at UBC uh, on stellar sea lines. Uh, when he got here, he thought a bit about what he would do for a PhD. Uh, he chose a topic that is not for the faint-hearted, which is, is there, uh, understanding multiple stresses on uh, coral reefs, uh, and then interpreting those multiple stresses in terms of management of uh, Through his PhD, he's worked very extensively with two co-supervisors, Nick Graham and Sean Conn. Uh, in fact, for a lot of his PhD, I think he's seen more of me than, than me. Uh, the management side of things now is now coming together, and uh, so I'm um, Alright, thank thanks everyone for showing up in the morning. So as Bob said, uh, my PhD is on the effect of multiple stressor interactions on coral reefs, which is a huge topic and I'll try and make it digestible. So just an outline of the talk, um, first general introduction about the topic, um, then I'll go through um, each of the research questions <coughs> which is addressed by each of the chapters. And for each of those I'll give a background that's specific to that research question. Um, as well as go through uh, the methods, some of the key results, so I don't have time to go through all of them for each chapter, obviously, um, and conclusions for each chapter. And finally, wrapping up with key contributions of the thesis generally, and of course, acknowledgements. So we all sort of have an intuitive notion of how stress works on an individual basis, but in the ecological context, it's much more complicated. Um, so first, we really need a working definition of what a stressor is. And during the mid-70s, early 80s, there was a flurry of activity in the field of stressor ecology. It was really when the field itself was born. Um, and there were a bunch of definitions thrown out there. They weren't all as consistent. Um, there was a lot of argument over whether a stressor um, could be something that resulted in a positive effect as well as a negative one. Um, this is sort of one of the, the key quotes from Odom um, in 1979, where he says that um, in an ecological um, context, uh, perturbation or stress is any deviation or displacement from the nominal state um, in structure or function uh, at any level of organizations, so whether that's the individual or the um, community. Um, and derivation of the term and general usage dictate that the stress should refer to a negative deflection. Um, so I won't go through all the other definitions that were sort of floated in the literature, but basically I've compiled them together in this working definition, which I use in my thesis, um, which is that a factor, uh, so a stressor, is a factor that's whether natural or anthropogenic in origin um, either external to or beyond the normal limits of an organism or community that causes a deleterious response in the organism or community. Um, so obviously there's an element of subjectivity to what deleterious is. It's, it's fairly clear usually on an individual level what a deleterious response is. You either get mortality or you get a decrease in function. At a community level, it's much more complicated. Um, but for the context of this thesis, we're usually talking about it in the context of um, coral reef management, so usually we're seeking to increase coral cover and increase diversity. So in that context, we can understand what deleterious is. So as we all know, coral reefs globally are under threat. Um, the sort of overarching threat is climate change, um, which can result in increased temperatures, both average temperatures and more frequent deviations from the average, um, increased uh, frequency of storms, whether that's um, more or fewer bigger storms or more smaller storms remain to be seen. Um, an increased frequency of flood events is, of course, associated with that. Um, and possibly increase in disease outbreaks. Um, of course, there's the ever-present fishing pressure and um, coastal development in agriculture, which results in nutrient loading or nutrification on reefs, um, sediment loading, and chemical pollution in the form of herbicides, um, pesticides, and heavy metals, that sort of thing. So there's been a flurry of um, discussion and debate in the coral reef literature over the multiple stressors how they interact, whether synergisms um, exist or not, and what, how extensive they are. Um, so it's quite topical, but a lot of debate is sort of centered over what synergy actually is. Um, and as Dunn pointed out in a coral reef paper in 2010, the term is often used carelessly in the literature. So he found several instances where authors would report that a synergistic interaction um, existed, um, even though statistically the interaction terms weren't significant. Um, and I'll go into this in a bit more detail in the next slide, but the most common usage of, synerg of synergy or synergism refers to non-additive behavior of, um, of variables. Um, it's also important to remember that stressors need not act simultaneously in order to be synergistic, so you could get them 
um, occurring in sequence and still get a synergistic effect. Um, and of course, in the real world, true independence between stressors is quite rare. So <clears throat> to understand uh, stressor effects and how they interact, this is a very sort of simple illustration. So on the top, we have an additive effect. So if the blue bar represents uh, the effect of one stressor and the orange bar represents the effect of the second stressor and the red bar represents their summed effect. So this is quite simply an additive effect. On the second row, we have a synergistic effect. So individually, the stressor effects are given um, by these bars, but when they're actually occurring together or synergist um, happening synergistically, um, the effect is greater than the sum of their parts. Um, finally, an antagonistic um, interaction is when the net effect of the two stressors is actually less than the sum of their parts. Um, and often people will use synergistic and antagonistic um, under the same umbrella as being synergistic because they're both departures from additivity. So what's the evidence for synergies in the literature? Well, in 2008, there was um, two papers that came out in the same issue of Ecology Letters. Um, one by Cray and Adele, um, looked at 171 studies um, across uh, all marine systems, so not just coral reefs, um, and found roughly a third um, for each category. So 26% of the studies found additive effects, 36% found synergistic effects, and 38% found antagonistic effects. Um, in this study, they aggregated all the response variables, so um, they looked at two broad categories, community-level responses and individual-level responses, but otherwise all the response variables were lumped together. Uh, the second paper was by Darling and Cote, this is a meta-analysis as well, um, looked at 112 studies across freshwater marine and terrestrial systems, but they only looked at mortality as the response variable, um, and they found little evidence of synergistic effects overall. So the average effect is not synergistic, even though individual studies did have did report synergistic effects. Um, and finally, the study I referred to earlier um, in coral reefs um, in 2010, um, where Dunn found that synergies were commonly um, analyzed and or reported incorrectly. So either people were using the wrong experimental designs or they weren't interpreting their statistical results correctly. And of course, multiple stressors are um, hugely relevant to management. Um, first of all, regulatory limits for a lot of pollutants are often set in isolation, um, so I don't consider how um, one pollutant in conjunction with another might actually cause worse effects. Um, identifying synergistic effects um, might allow for more efficient mitigation, so if you can focus on the stressor that's more likely to interact with another stressor, you could focus on that instead of trying to address everything. And of course, geographically mapping stressor effects can help you to identify areas of concern and where you should focus. So the overall or overarching research theme of my thesis is to explore the role of multiple stressors and their interactions in coral reef ecosystems and their consequences for management. And I've broken this out into four specific questions. So first, what evidence do we have for non-additive and non-independent um, interactions between stressors and coral reefs? Um, second, are bleaching disease episodes acting independently on the Great Barrier Reef? So this is a, sort of a case study. Um, third, what are experts' perceptions about, no uh, about the knowledge gaps of multiple stressors? And how can um, this expert knowledge help fill the gaps, if there are any? Um, and finally, what are the implications of multiple stressor interactions for coral reef conservation? And importantly, in the context of the Great Barrier Reef, at least, are stressed reefs over or underrepresented in the existing protected area network? <clears throat> so chapter one sort of lays the foundation for all this um, and systematically goes through the evidence for um, synergistic effects in uh, coral reefs. So as I pointed out um, earlier, meta-analyses do exist, um, but they're neither ecosystem nor response variable specific. So they either lump ecosystems together or they lump response variables together, or both. Um, they typically assume that the stressors are independent. Um, and as I'll point out in a minute, the methodology that they're using might actually be underestimating, underestimating the prevalence of synergistic effects. So <clears throat> this is sort of the key um, difference in my meta-analysis versus a lot of the previous ones. In a lot of other meta-analyses, what they do when they try to um, estimate whether a synergistic effect is present is they'll take the means from uh, each of, uh, say in this case, four studies, um, and they have an expectation of what the result of, say, two interacting stressors will be, and that's a simple additive expectation, which is given in the first column here. Um, and then they have an observed effect, so what they actually observe when they apply two stressors. And if you take the mean across all of those studies, um, in this case, 
the additive expectation gives you a mean of four, but the 95% confidence interval is plus or minus 2.5. And for the observed, you get a mean of 6.3 and a confidence interval of 3.4. So obviously these two numbers actually overlap if you look at the confidence intervals. But that's not actually the way you should be doing it. So what you should be doing <coughs> is looking on a study-by-study -study basis, what's the difference between the um, additive expectations, what you expect, and what you observe. So if you subtract the first column from the second across each study, this is the difference between sort of the, the uh, expectation and the um, observed effect. And if you look at the mean difference, it's now 2.25 plus minus 0.94, which would lead you to conclude that there is, in fact, uh, a synergistic effect going on. So in effect, what the difference is between doing the first way and the second way is doing an unpaired t-test, which would tell you that the means are not significant, versus a uh, paired t-test, which would tell you that, in fact, the, means, the difference in means is significant. So what we did in this uh, meta-analysis is use the latter method and effectively look at the differences within studies, um, where <coughs> because the variation between studies might be large, you might be missing the individual effects of studies. So the first step was to comb through all the literature and come up with a database um, of all of the potential references. Um, I categorized these by the independent variable, so the stressor variable, the dependent variable, or the response, and the type of study, whether it was a field study, lab study, um, model, or review. Um, so this was basically the screening step for the quantitative meta-analysis. Um, so I had to tabulate the number of studies for each pairwise interaction, so for each pair of stressors, um, how many studies looked at that interaction. And the results of that were, um, I have categorized here by response variable. So the most numerous um, response variable was calcification, um, followed by photosynthesis and on down the line. Um, the reason I didn't look at calcification is because Neil Chen just uh, published an analysis on this recently. Um, that's the first reason. The second reason being that actually when I start breaking it down by the type of stressor variable, there's actually more studies in the photosynthesis category. Um, that properly examines um, <coughs> multiple stressors than calcification studies. So one of the, the different uh, ways I looked at these stressor interactions is to map the relationship of studies that looked at, or the relationship of stressors based on the number of uh, studies that were looking at the relationships between stressors, so not just between stressor and response, but between stressors themselves. So this sort of gets at the, um, whether stressors are acting independently or not. Um, and basically this network diagram um, shows a couple of things. So basically the size of each of the boxes shows how connected each stressor is to each other stressor in the network. So in this case, sedimentation um, <coughs> is the most connected stressor in the network. So whether through first order or second order interactions, more stressors have some sort of relationship with sedimentation um, than any other. The red arrow just indicates uh, a bi-directional relationship, so between storms and temperatures, so when you have higher um, sea surface temperatures, you're more likely to get a large storm. And when a storm passes over um, a body of water, it actually cools the surface, so there's a bidirectional uh, relationship there. <laughs> Similarly to nutrients and irradiance, so um, irradiance can drive phytoplankton bloom, which then drive nutrients down. And when you get a phytoplankton bloom, you actually reduce irradiance in the water column. Um, all the other um, relationships here are unidirectional, so um, Increased irradiance can, for example, decrease pathogen loading, um, and so on. <coughs> so from that initial qualitative step, um, I narrowed things down to 390 candidate studies. Um, this side further winnow down based on experimental design, so were they a fully factorial design, um, and was I able to extract data from them? So did they report their confidence intervals? Did they report their sample sizes? And surprisingly, in a lot of cases, people don't do that. So just an example, this is from Takahashi et al. 2004. This is an example of a well-conducted fully factorial study where they're looking at the effects of both light and temperature. So for each study, um, if they didn't report the numbers in the text, I would have to um, essentially extract it from the graphs. So I would grab the, uh, the means and the associated um, error measure as well as the sample size. Um, I did not do calculate an effect size based on the difference between the um, observed and expected value. I um, then do a Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo simulation of these effect sizes um, and the associated confidence intervals around those effect sizes. So in the end, this is what I ended up with. So 
one of the key things to note on this slide is just how small the sample sizes are. When I actually boil things down to using the same um, uh, stressor variables and the same response variables, there's only, there are only 17 studies looked at um, FDFM, which is photosynthetic efficiency, three studies looked at chlorophyll A concentration, uh, six that looked at zooxanthellae density, um, and there were a number of individual studies that used some other um, variable that no, no other studies looked at. So in total, there were 26 studies looking at photosynthesis that looked at a light and temperature interaction. And this uh, just depicts the effect sizes, their departure from the um, expected effect size. And none of these are, are statistically significantly different from zero. Um, so from this, we conclude that there was actually no evidence for synergistic effects, at least um, in the context of photosynthetic response variables um, with light and temperature being the stressors which is somewhat surprising. So the bottom line from this chapter, first um, rigorously conducted and reported multiple stressor studies are still uncommon despite um, outward appearances, and there are still huge knowledge gaps um, in what we know about any specific response variable and any specific stressor. Um, this is actually consistent with the findings of the previous meta-analyses in spite of the fact that we're actually using uh, a method which should uh, give us an increased chance of detecting these synergistic interactions. Um, so in general, uh, little evidence exists for synergistic effects um, in the studies I looked at. Um, that being said, the responses are highly variable and most likely species specific. Um, although not all of the evidence is in, the trend seems to be that um, there might be a hint of synergistic effects going on, but there's not enough evidence to <clears throat> conclude that. So in the second chapter, I looked at the issue of stressor independence a little more closely, um, using a case study of bleaching disease on the Great Barrier Reef. <clears throat> so a lot of studies have looked uh, or have posited a relationship between disease outbreaks and bleaching susceptibility, but few have tested, at least on a broad scale, um, either temporally or spatially, whether you can explicitly predict bleaching from disease and vice versa. Um, I mean, the obvious explanation for a relationship between bleaching and disease um, is that they might both be facilitated by some common environmental variables, namely rising ocean temperatures or temperature anomalies. Um, but there are other possible explanations. So first, the microbial hypothesis of coral bleaching, um, in which bleaching is actually a form of disease itself, so an infection causes disease. Um, the coral probiotic hypothesis, so bleaching disrupts the symbiotic community of bacteria associated with the coral and then allows subsequent uh, invasion by another pathogen, um, and bleaching may simply just compromise immune competence directly. Um, so you might be asking, well, is bleaching actually a stressor? Well, in the context of those three hypotheses, clearly it is, because bleaching is a precursor to the um, occurrence of some response, namely disease. So for this study, I looked at the AIMS long-term monitoring program. Uh, and combined it with the representative areas program. The LTMP looks primarily at offshore areas. The um, REP looks primarily at inshore areas. Um, the data uh, uh, extended from 1998, or more accurately, 1999, which was when they fully started uh, collecting data, uh, to 2010. Um, and the depth surveyed were either between two and five meters or between six and nine meters. And I'll talk about the significance of that uh, a little bit later. I then obtained or calculated six different uh, temperature metrics, which are all have been commonly used to predict bleaching, um, at least in uh, reef flat habitats, so shallow waters. So I'm not going to go through the details of these, but basically weekly sea surface temperature anomaly, degree heating weeks, uh, the mean positive summer anomaly, hot snap, cold snap, and winter condition. These are all different ways of integrating uh, time and temperature uh, thresholds. So the overall procedure for this chapter was first to establish a baseline model, which just included environmental variables, so basically those, um, those temperature metrics I was talking about. Then I checked for temporal autocorrelation of the resulting bleaching disease, so are they correlated in time or with a one-year lag? Uh, checked for spatial autocorrelation um, in bleaching disease, so are there clusters of bleaching disease occurring? I then added bleaching to the white syndrome model and white syndrome to the bleaching model as another predictor variable to see if that changed the performance of the baseline model or not. Um, finally, I took out the environmental predictors and just used bleaching and disease variables to see whether those alone provide any predictive utility. 
In order to measure model performance, you use something called the pure skill score. Um, so it's important when you are trying to predict any rare event, so say an event that occurs one in a thousand years. If you come up with a very simple model that says the event never happens, you'd be right, 999 years out of a thousand. But that model is not very informative. So the pure skill score um, is used for uh, occasions where you're trying to predict something that's quite rare and it penalizes models appropriately um, when they're not informative. And it's an absolute me measure of model performance, so it ranges from negative one to one. Positive one is a perfect predictive model. Negative one means that your model predicts the opposite of what happens. And zero would be a random or constant model. Um, and this has been used in the past to test bleaching models. So Van Hoydenk and Hoover in Coral Reach 2009 um, applied the pure skill score to various um, predictors of bleaching. So moving on to the results. So for the white cinder models, um, the first thing to note is that the um, Pure skill scores are all pretty consistent, around 0 0.3. And there's no uh, statistically significant difference between models. So whether I just use environmental um, variables, whether I add bleaching in there, if I look at bleaching in the previous year, um, and then finally if I took out the environmental variables and just looked at bleaching, um, no difference from baseline. The situation is a little bit more interesting when I look at bleaching models. So first thing to note, is that the skill scores are very low, so between 0 and 0 0.15, um, which is telling me something about the, oops, about the uh, utility of these environmental variables in predicting bleaching events in this data set. So just the environmental variables, um, environmental variables plus white syndrome in the same year, no difference. When I added the white syndrome uh, occurrence from the previous year, model performance did improve, but the actual term, the white syndrome term, was not significant. So the model's capturing something, but it's white syndrome isn't the informative variable in this case. Um, and finally, when I pulled out the environmental variables and just used white syndrome, there's basically no utility to the model, so it's no better than random. If I look at spatial clustering, so this is across the entire Great Barrier Reef, and I'll zoom in to those areas to show you where uh, there's statistically significant spatial clusters. So up near Cairns and in the south, um, there are a couple of clusters of, um, of white syndrome that uh, stood out across the entire data set. And then if we look at bleaching across the same range and zoom into the same areas, they don't actually align. So spatially, there's the clustering is happening in different places. So that's one strike against um, the co-occurrence of bleaching disease. <clears throat> so in conclusion, so temporally, there's no correlation between bleaching and white syndrome in this data set. Um, Similarly, spatially, there is um, no clustering of bleaching and white syndrome with each other. And the relatively poor performance of um, the environmental indicators in predicting bleaching, so those low pure skill scores, um, are pointing to the fact that predicting bleaching in reef slope habitats is probably much more complicated than it is in reef flat habitats. So pretty much all the previous work that has looked at uh, the correlations between bleaching and disease on the Great Barrier Reef have used aerial survey data for bleaching, um, which only really tells you about bleaching in in the very shallow areas that are visible from the airplane. It's not something that's going on in the reef slope habitat. So given all of these uh, knowledge gaps that have um, uh, I elucidated through chapter one, um, is there an alternative to, to just looking at the data? And hopefully there is, and that's expert elicitation. Um, so what are experts' perceptions about the, the gaps in the literature and gaps in knowledge? And can their knowledge help fill these gaps? So the complexity um, of multiple stressors in increases exponentially with the number of stressors, the number of interactions. Um, once you get beyond two interactions, it becomes hopelessly complicated. So the amount of data on a specific interaction is going to be vanishingly small for any response variable or any pair of stressor uh, variables. So if time and resources are limited, which they obviously are, is there a rapid way to assess threats in some sort of quantitative manner um, and prioritize management um, actions? So the answer may be Bayesian belief networks. So just a little background first. Um, Bayesian methods incorporate prior beliefs knowledge. We're sort of all inherently Bayesian in the way we think. And they inevitably make probabilistic uh, predictions about the state of the world, which is um, qualitatively different from a frequentist um, perspective. They're primarily used as a decision support tool, so it's a way of conceptualizing the system, um, sort of visually um, and mentally. Um, the design of the Bayesian belief network doesn't require specialist skills, so in many cases, um, the users are the designers. 
Um, so you do this often do this in a workshop setting. Um, it's been done in uh, developing countries to um, to work out some management strategies for say pests and fields. Um, the outputs are thus readily interpretable by lay people, um, and Bayesian belief networks are designed inherently to incorporate uncertainty in the parameterization of design. So, <clears throat> sort of a more concrete example that might help you to understand how a Bayesian belief network works. Um, if we have a very simple sort of response variable, in this case, the grass being wet. Well, what are the things that can lead to grass being wet? The sprinkler could have been turned on or could have rained. Um, and what might ultimately lead to, uh, to that situation? Well, it's the weather. So the parent node, which doesn't have um, anything feeding into it, in this case, is whether it's cloudy or not. And we're assuming a uniform prior. So basically, it's a 50-50 chance that the weather's cloudy or it's not. If it's cloudy, it's much more likely to rain. So cloudy true, um, and the probability of it raining is about 80% that it's cloudy. If there's no clouds, then it's probably not going to rain, but there's still a chance that it might. Similarly, um, so if it's cloudy, um, we're probably not going to sprinkle, so there's a chance that the sprinkler won't be turned on. If it's not cloudy, we might set the sprinklers on or, or not. But ultimately, what we're interested in is all the permutations of these possibilities. So if the sprinkler was off and it hadn't rained, then the grass is almost certainly dry, not wet. If the sprinkler was on um, and it didn't rain, then the grass is probably going to be wet, but it might have dried off, so 90% probability of the grass being wet. Uh, if you flip it around, so it rained, but the sprinkler wasn't on, similarly 90% probability of the grass is wet, and it rained. <laughs> <laughs> if it rained and the sprinkler was on, then 99% 90, 90 chance the grass is wet. So this end table is called the conditional probability table, and this is what I'm interested in getting from the experts. And so obviously, you know, the more states you have, the more variables you have, the longer the table gets. So it's sort of important to try and keep these tables as manageable and as constrained as possible. Otherwise, people just get overwhelmed by the number of different possibilities in that conditional probability table. So why use expert elicitation? Um, Olaf Helmer was the developer of the Delphi method, which is sort of a structured method of eliciting um, numbers from experts, and he said we're faced with two options. We can either throw up our hands in despair and wait until we have an adequate theory enabling us to deal with socioeconomic and political problems, or we can insert ecological problems here, as confidently as we do with problems in physics and chemistry, or we can make the most of an admittedly unsatisfactory situation and try to obtain the relative, relevant intuitive insights of experts and then use their judgments as systematically as possible. So the key word here is being systematic. We're not just asking people for wild house guesses about what they're these numbers are, we're actually trying to get a structured approach to get these numbers from people. So <clears throat> from the literature, I, conduct, I uh, constructed an initial model um, of stress interactions. I then selected an initial expert pool based on people's publication records, on so ecology, uh, coral reef ecology, and the Great Barrier Reef in the past 10 years. And then from that initial pool, I basically snowballed responses, so asked people for recommendations of three other people they consider experts. Um, I used the four-point elicitation method for probabilities, which I'll talk about in the next slide, um, and I obtained point estimates for scenarios. So once I sort of conditioned people to thinking in this in this structured way, I can then just pull a single number from them for the more complicated scenarios. So the four-step question format, um, which Spires Bridge et al. evaluated in 2010 and found to be the most consistent in getting uh, numbers from experts, consists of four questions. Uh, first, realistically, what do you think the lowest possible value is? Second, what do you think the highest possible value is? Third, what is your best estimate, which obviously should lie between those two extremes? And finally, how confident are you that the interval you created from lowest to highest could capture the true value? And this number should be between 50 and 100 percent, because if it's under 50 percent, you're basically saying that I'm pretty sure the number lies outside this interval that I just told you. <laughs> So this is the model. Um, I'll try and walk you through it here. So across the top, we have um, <coughs> primarily environmental variables, so irradiance, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, um, sediment loading, nutrient loading, pollution. Um, those, in turn, can lead to uh, changes in cyclone frequency. So uh, cyclones are uh, more frequent are decreasing or um, absent in more frequently in La Nina years. Um, similarly, flood events 
frequency is affected by El Nino. Um, temperature anomalies um, have an interaction with uh, water quality to affect bleaching probability. All of these things feed into crown of thorns outbreaks. Um, disease is affected by uh, temperature and water quality as well. These aggregate boxes basically are just pulling together, um, in this case, anthropogenic stress is pulling together sedimentation, nutrient loading, pollution, and fishing pressure, and just come up with an index. And basically, that's just a way of keeping that final probability table manageable. So basically, I weight those individual variables into one index, and then that one index feeds into the final table. And of course, um, crown thorns outbreaks, bleaching disease all have an effect on the bottom line. In this case, the bottom line I'm interested in is what's the probability that hard coral cover will stay the same or increase given the following combination of conditions. So for each of the possible states of these boxes, I'm asking the experts, how likely is it that to cause a decline in coral cover? So the expert pool, uh, pool consisted of 21 respondents in the end, uh, spread between the University of Queensland, James Cook, um, Australian Institute of Marine Science and the Great Barrier Reef and Reef Park Authority, plus a few independent people. The average number of years experience in the expert pool is 20, um, ranging between 8 and 40. Uh, this is just a diagram of the individual respondents. So blue are the people I talked to, and then red are the people I didn't talk to. The arrows just indicate um, where people recommended another person. So person 165 came recommended by pretty much everyone. Um, and the people I didn't talk to in red are more or less on the fringes. So they're basically only recommended by one person, with a few exceptions. So I don't have time to go through all of the, the probability table of the entire model, but just give you an example. Um, this is the probability table relating to the probability of disease outbreaks. Um, this background box is basically, is there any probability that you'll get a disease outbreak if there's no unusual environmental conditions? So given the normal range of variation, do disease outbreaks just happen randomly? Um, and then manipulating one variable at a time, so if temperature increases above a certain threshold, how does that change the probability of disease outbreak? If cold temperatures affect disease outbreak, um, probability. Uh, this is given current water quality, so um, the combination of nutrients, sediments, um, and pollutants, if we make water quality better and if we make water quality worse. So basically increasing water quality, consensus opinion, this is the median uh, response, is that it doesn't really have an effect on disease um, outbreak probability. But if water quality gets worse, then yes, it does. Should be some consensus that that does actually make the probability of disease outbreaks higher. And the outliers are the individual dots. So there's a considerable range of opinion ranging from no effect to almost 100% probability that if you if water quality gets 30% worse, which is the scenario I gave them, that disease outbreaks will increase. So looking at the, the bottom line, so the probability of <coughs> existing coral cover being the same or increasing. Um, if cyclones get worse, um, median response is about a quarter percent probability that, um, that coral cover will stay the same or increase. If uh, crown of thorns outbreaks become more frequent, that drops to about 30%, similarly with mass bleaching events. Um, disease outbreaks um, don't seem to be as much of a, of a problem, according to the experts, so still about a 50% probability, it could be a 60% um, probability. But anthropogenic stress is sort of where there's a lot of variation in opinion. So this considers fishing pressure, uh, nutrient loading, sediment loading, and pollution, um, all in that indexed, uh, or all in that one index. So there's quite a range on what effect that might have on the probability the coral cover will, will decline. So <clears throat> from this chapter, one of the, the key findings is that really the consensus trajectory for the Great Barrier Reef is not optimistic. The, the median response, even under a baseline scenario, is only about a 50% probability that coral cover is going to stay the same or increase in the next 10 years. Um, Opinion was quite divided over water quality effects on bleaching and disease. Uh, so some people thought there was quite a strong role of water quality, um, other people not so much. Um, and in the end, manageable stressors, the so things we could actually do local management um, action on, actually made little difference to the probability of decline. There was some difference, but overall um, not a huge effect. So putting this into a spatial context, so what does this look like? Um, uh, geographically or space. What are these? What are the implications for for conservation um, if we if we carry on these findings from the previous chapter? So, 
Across the Great Barrier Reef, of course, broad, broad scale stresses are um, increasing, so mass bleaching events, disease, and coastal development. Um, and climate change adaptation will probably involve some sort of local management. So hopefully we can forestall some of the effects of climate change by managing um, stressors that are under, under the control of local management and potentially reduce things like mass bleaching events. <clears throat> but is that going to work? So for this, I used four scenarios. So baseline is basically status quo. Everything uh, 10 years from now is the same as it is now. Uh, under a climate change scenario, I basically just tweaked the magnitude of the temperature anomalies. So I bumped them up by uh, 0.2 degrees Celsius. Um, over 10 years, that's fairly modest. Um, so that also had knock-on effects with uh, increased flood plume extent. Um, you'd expect more storms. Increased temperature, so um, in this case, I just manipulated the anomaly, not the average temperature, um, and changes in cyclone frequency. Um, I then looked at a climate change plus management scenario, so all of the environmental variables in this scenario were the same as the previous scenario. But now I decreased uh, nutrient sediment and pollution loading. Um, and a decreased fishing pressure outside reserves, of course, assuming that fishing pressure inside reserves um, was zero. Uh, and finally, management only scenario, which is sort of an optimistic scenario in which temperature anomalies don't actually change at all, but we um, uh, implement all these management actions. So again, same model. Um, everything in gray is sort of spatially explicit. Um, and so is, is a non-spatial index, so that basically didn't come into play. Um, so for each of the, the boxes in gray, I had a data layer, um, which I could um, calculate different values for every, uh, for every reef in the data set, uh, and then let the model propagate all of those probabilities um, through the entire network. So in this case, um, the bars, this, is the, this could be a, a specific pixel where uh, you have increased fishing pressure, uh, increased pollution, increased nutrient loading, increased sedimentation. That results in aggregate anthropogenic stress index of 100% increasing. Um, High temperature anomaly, um, the model's predicting a 50-50 chance of disease there. Um, combined flood events and cyclones resulting in 97% probability of increasing uh, chronotorrents in conjunction with uh, decreased water quality. Um, and basically, when you permute all of those probabilities through the model sum, but for this given reef, there's an 88% probability that it'll decline. So just going to present a couple of the results from here. Um, so first, the baseline scenario on the left. Um, the reefs in red have the highest probability of decline. The reefs in green have the lowest probability of decline. And this is just zoomed in on sort of the, central, uh, the central section of the GBR and just confined to the shelf reefs, which is what I was asking people about. Under the, the climate change scenario, so this is with um, a 0.2 uh, degree addition to the um, climatological anomalies. Um, basically, it drives everything down, so between 70 and 85 percent probability of decline. So it's mainly the increased probability of um, mass bleaching events that's driving that, that decline. So if we look across the, in, the entire data sets between unfished areas in the top row and fished areas in the bottom row, what's the probability in this model that coral cover will decline? Um, under the baseline scenario, uh, the mean probability is just under uh, 50%, so about 45% in protected areas, um, and 55% probably decline roughly um, outside protected areas. Under a climate change scenario, um, mean probability of decline has obviously gone much higher, so it's up near 75% um, inside, um, and similarly about 75% outside, although there's a slight difference in those means. Climate change plus management, it's a little bit lower, mean probability of decline inside, so about 72%. Um, versus outside protected areas or unfished areas, um, still about 75%. So obviously between these two histograms, there's not a lot of difference, uh, well, there's almost no difference in the mean. The shape has changed slightly, but the shape outside protected areas um, of the histogram has actually changed much more outside. Um, so everything's sort of um, being sh uh, shoved together and towards the mean. But across all of these scenarios, the, the mean probability of decline inside protected areas was uh, lower than the probability of decline outside protected areas. So main conclusions from this, well, reefs within protected areas generally have a higher persistence probability, although in some cases it's not a huge difference. Um, and aggressive management of, of stressors, so um, ratcheting down sediment and nutrient loading, um, and potentially decreasing fishing pressure, not only uh, or outside uh, protected areas, could alleviate some climate change effects, but 
the effect in this model is actually quite small. So this chapter is still a work in progress, so I still have to explore some of the, the parameter space in this model um, and look at what the effect of different uh, responses or using different confidence levels from the experts could result in um, different outputs from the model. Um, and might also explore some assumptions about the susceptibility. So were areas that bleached in the past <coughs> more or less susceptible to bleaching in the future? And obviously that's an area of active debate. So overall, key contributions of this thesis. Well, first chapter, uh, really the first comprehensive review of, of coral reef specific multiple stressor literature. So previous meta-analyses have not been ecosystem specific. They have not segregated response variables. <clears throat> and more often than not, they've used the wrong methodology to look at evidence for synergies. Um, and the second chapter is really the first to study to look at bleaching and disease, disease data consistently from the LTMP. So previous studies have looked at um, disease and bleaching using um, aerial survey data for bleaching, but LTMP data for disease. And so the first look at, um, that, at those two phenomena in, a, in the same habitat. Um, I use a novel implementation of the expert elicitation process. So typically expert elicitation occurs um, in a workshop setting in multiple days. Um, takes a lot of time um, on everyone's part. Uh, the approach I used one-on-one -on -one interviews was much uh, faster and took two and a half an hour, an hour between each person. Um, and could be a way in the future to rapidly develop these sorts of models for, for ecosystems um, under threat. And finally, it's the first study I'm aware of that actually quantified expert opinion about trajectories for the Great Barrier Reef um, and what the future of the Great Barrier Reef might look like. So publications arising from my thesis. Um, one of the chapters has already been published in Coral Reefs. That was the, um, the bleaching and white syndrome chapter. Um, I've submitted the meta-analysis to Global Chain Biology, and I'm currently writing up chapters three and four. Um, I've also contributed to some other publications over the course of my PhD. And I'd just like to thank all of my funding agencies and collaborators in this project and uh, everyone in the center. Thank you very much. <laughs>
future paper, um, is look at the, the relationships between experts. So whether people who, who reciprocally named each other as experts are more likely to have similar opinions. Um, I also have a slide about um, sort of institutional affiliations that shows that um, James Cook University and Ames are quite tightly connected, but UQ um, and Vermont are sort of marginalized. Um, but there are still sort of some very strong connections between individuals in those organizations. So it would be interesting to look at whether, I guess, people's opinions tend to converge um, when they're working together, or whether it's more drives people to separate camps, which might be the case in certain institutions. Um, sort of leading on from that, yeah. um, from, from your results in chapter three, that there's huge variation in terms of what people perceive is going to happen to coral cover with these different threats. Yeah. So from previous work using Bayesian belief networks, is that level of variation normal, or, or, or do you? Yeah, I mean, so obviously, like, you know, slightly tighter confidence. So obviously, it depends on the question you're asking. So in in, er in the area where you're sort of going asking people to speculate. Um, and whether there's, and if there's a large sort of divergence in opinion, then, I mean, a, a workshop type elicitation approach will tend to make those confidence levels come down because just the interaction of people will sort of, they'll come to a consensus um, whether they're aware of it or not, um, just by being in the same room with other people and certain people are going to drive the conversation. So one of the sort of advantages, potentially, of the one-on-one -on -one approach is that you don't get this contamination of people's uh, opinions from you know the big personalities in the room. Um, but ideally, the best situation would actually be to, to go back and do a second round of interviews and, and present at least one-on-one -on -one what everyone else said and see whether that people budge it all. So potentially, do another round would probably bring that, that interval down. So once people see what other people think, then they will think, yeah, maybe I was wrong about that. I was just wondering if that massive uncertainty indicates that as a, as a community, mm. we haven't really got a clue what's going on. <laughs> That's entirely people, possible. People like the science isn't really there to say, What's going to happen to coral cover on the GBR with bleach and cyclone? Mm, yeah. is, is that one interpretation? Would you yeah. say that yeah, for people sure. are just stabbing in the dark? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be an interesting uh, sentence in your abstract. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, the, yeah. the, the biggest variability you saw there was on the anthropogenic disturbances. Yeah. That's a compound indicator of four yes. different inputs. Have yeah. you looked at disaggregating that and seeing if you're there's any so I mean the problem there is is basically that I'd have to go back to people and ask them okay let's discard this aggregate index and just look at the effects one by one um, so I couldn't do it with the data I've got now at least not easily but um, yeah it would be interesting to look at whether you know disaggregating those things but, I mean I can look at the stress or weightings that people gave me and I didn't present those results here and see whether there's a large variation in the weights that people gave me for the most part people didn't think fishing pressure was that important but there were individuals who Disagree quite strongly with that. Um, yeah. Uh, and Sean, sorry. Yeah, so, um, I guess two things. One is uh, with respect to the issue that Nick raised. I mean, another possibility is that core reef scientists don't really properly understand probability. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's partly facetious, but there are cognitive biases that mm. are, human beings are known to have, for example, overestimating the risk of rare events and so forth. Yeah. So, those things. So, so, for example, you don't have very many probabilities that are less than 1% or more than 99%. They're yeah. all sort of in that range of tens of percent. The other thing was when I, when you were going through the results for chapter three, mm -hmm. and I was looking at the histograms, I thought, gosh, those histograms are really similar for the protected and unprotected rooms. I mean, the shapes were different, but they were basically spanning the same range. Yeah. And the climate change only and the climate change plus management histograms were also very similar. Yeah. And so I expected you to say that that uh, the experts don't seem to think that local management uh, is very important. Mm -hmm. Mostly what's driving what's going to happen is climate change. Yeah. And yet you concluded the opposite. And uh, I can't quite work out, other than very small differences in those averages, I, I couldn't work out what your grounds were for drawing that conclusion. Right? So if you go back and you look at the actual histogram, yep. I mean, there's an enormous amount of overlap between mm -hmm. these. And so if you yep. picked a, a reef on, a, a picked a reef at random, for example, from the protected reefs, yep. and then said, okay, what fraction of the of the unprotected reefs are more or less likely to decline? I would think you'd get reasonably, on average, reasonably large values on either side. Mm. Surely the explanation for that again is the fact that these reefs aren't going to be 
affected by the management, which is what a quality management yeah. is in the briefs, in a sense, uh, except through Crown of Thorns link, that, yeah. you know, those mid-shelf protected briefs, mid-shelf unprotected briefs, um, reducing sediment loads, although, on, 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 as I say, at the moment, zero impact on any of that. Mm -hmm. um, nutrients, maybe a little, pesticides, not much. Yeah. So you wouldn't expect any difference. So I think the the main message is that the mean doesn't change much, but the reefs that were sort of at the fringes, um, the reefs that were most at risk could potentially be bumped up um, a bit by the management action, even though the overall mean um, doesn't actually change much between the, the climate change and climate change management scenario. So it's really more of a, I guess, a, you want to look at on a reef by reef basis, you know, is it worth doing some management action to potentially move this reef, this individual reef from a, from a high at risk category to a moderately um, lower risk category, um, rather than doing it on a, a sweeping basis across the entire Great Barrier Reef. You might focus on the reefs that are sort of most at risk and say, is it worth saving this reef? Is it worth doing some management action in this catchment to save this reef and this reef and this reef? And how much, pro how much time are we going to buy by doing that management action? Just back to the wide range in the, uh, we saw for water quality again, management, uh, that's, I'm sure that's just a factor of it. Your other variables like increased temperature to me are simple variables. Water quality is a really terrible term and I avoid using it yeah. because what if you talk, as you said, you're talking about suspended sediment effects which are complicated by the resource in, into the light and sedimentation. You're talking about nutrients which have nitrogen and phosphorus receptors and have a whole range of things and your pollutants, well I'm assuming that's pesticides, all pesticides aren't the same are they? Yeah, right. <laughs> so, I, so I, you know, expecting what effects you'll have by managing those in common somehow or separately and the spatial scale of that, there's no doubt the opinions would be everywhere from zero <coughs> to understand about the Yeah, so one of the aims with this model is sort of get a big picture of what's going on. So Colette Thomas did a very complicated um, model for seagrass, which involves you know, experts from all different fields. And it's a quite, that was a thesis by itself, essentially. Um, so I was really looking for a middle ground between a very simple um, model and this monster. Um, and then, you know, sort of open the door to, okay, well, let's focus on this, this component of the model and how can we parameterize that component better. But, um, so yeah, so what I was really going for was a big picture Broad sweep type thing. Josh? See, a lot of times these networks are done in information poor situations where mm -hmm. you just don't know about it. But it seems to me like you actually have some information um, on some of those where you could actually parameterize that. And you yeah. could actually, oh, you did do that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, for, how, so, how did the experts go with reality? Okay, so that's the part where, where I, I didn't really have that, that happy um, coincidence between, between data and opinion. So, um, <laughs> so for things like, I had data on, you know, how does the El Nino index historically affect cyclone frequency and flood frequency? So for that, those parts of the model was actually able to fill those in with data. So it was the, the parts we didn't have a good handle on, you know, we've had two, some might argue, two mass leaching events in the past 20 years. And, and that's not really enough data to tell you um, in broad terms, you know, what the probability of future breaching events is. Right. Um, across this entire suite of reefs. Um, so yeah, really what I was looking for with this exercise was to fill those gaps where we didn't really have good data on those specific interactions, but combine that with you know aspects of the model where we did have data. Um, but so I can pull up the temperature data and the radiance data and how those relate to some of the other um, natural events. But yeah, so those, I was looking to fill the, the, the gaps with the expert opinion. Okay. Okay, thanks, Steve. Thank you.